God and others as yourself. Find little ways where only you can help. With his great love, a tiny rock can make a giant fall. Dream small. It's visiting the widow down the street. Or dancing on a Friday with your friend with special needs. These simple moments change. Good morning, Revive. So excited to be here with you this morning. Why don't we stand and worship the Lord? Father, I pray that you would show yourself and reveal yourself to be great among us this morning. As every heart opens, God, to worship and to receive the word, Lord, may it just be revealed to us how great you are, oh God. We give you praise and worship and glory and honor this morning because of your greatness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So good to be in God's house, and I'm so glad to see you here this morning. Your pastor is away, speaking in Canada six nights, and uh, he'll be back home on Tuesday morning, but I'm going to fill in for him because I'm just that good to him. 
But we can do this. Amen? God is here. God is present. He's got a word for you today, and I'm excited about it. He told me a quick story. He was, oh my goodness, he had a horrific flight. And uh, I'm telling you, I'm just thanking God. I'm actually rejoicing, like almost that kind of jumping, excited, rejoicing that I did not go. <laughs> I am so glad I did not go. But we had a kind of a rough trip to um, flight to Florida and a flight back. The middle of Florida, celebrating our anniversary, was amazing, but the flight there and the flight back was delayed. So he pretty much got off the plane the next day, got back on a plane to head to Canada, and it's just been an absolute nightmare. Seriously spent at least 10 hours in the Chicago airport where it was shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder people. He said, it wouldn't be so bad if you could get a seat, sit down and read a book or something. He said, but you couldn't even sit down. He said, there wasn't even floor space. You literally had to stand there almost the whole time, seriously. And the people were loud. It was a nightmare. So I, I'm really happy. He finally made it to Toronto and then on to um, New Brunswick, Canada. But he did have this experience I have to tell you about since you know him so well. So he's on the plane, extremely tired. He falls asleep, and there's this beautiful, older, older than me, older lady sitting beside him. <laughs> and of course, he's sound asleep because he's so exhausted, and the plane touches down with a jolt, and he reaches over and grabs her leg. <laughs> <laughs> and squeezed it real hard. And he said, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I thought you were my wife. <laughs> so then he said to me, so needless to say, on the second flight, he, uh, he sat beside a much younger, prettier woman and stayed completely awake. <laughs> but keep him in your prayers. He's uh, happy to be with his family and happy to be at their camp meeting this week. I want you to stand with me one more time because we're going to get ready to enter into the presence of the Lord and then we're going to bring the word. But let's say our Believer's Creed. Do you still love it? Don't get used to it. I pretty much got it memorized. I only stumble once in a while now and then. But close your eyes if you can and say this. This is what you believe because this is the truth. I am a believer. I believe in Almighty God the Father, the creator of all there is. I believe in Jesus Christ the Lord, God's only Son, born of a virgin womb. I believe Christ died for me, returned to life, rose to heaven, and is coming back to earth again. I believe in the Holy Spirit and His power to help me be like Christ and do His work. I believe in the Bible, God's holy word, and all His promises to me of abundant and eternal life. I believe in the church. God's forever family. I am the righteousness of God in Christ because I am washed in the blood of the Lamb, filled with His Spirit, happy, holy, forgiven, and free. I am, say it loud, highly favored and deeply loved. I am a believer. Amen. Amen. God bless you as we worship.
may be seated. I have a couple of announcements for you this to, to this morning. Um, I just want to talk about uh, our Wednesday morning Bible study at uh, 11 a.m. 
It is amazing. If you guys have the time and you're just not doing anything during the day, it's an amazing um, service with Pastor Holmes, and there's amazing hymns that are sung. It's just a, a just a quiet and a beautiful morning just to spend with the Lord. So if you have, like, your Wednesday morning spree and you just – you just need a blessing from God. Just stop in at 11 a.m. and you will enjoy that. Also, on that same day, Wednesday, 7 p.m., we have our uh, Wednesday night worship. But this Wednesday night, it's going to be our worship encounter. So it's going to be an entire service full of worship and just um, praises to God and just a word. And just it's going to be amazing. So if you guys love worship and you guys love just declaring the name of the Lord, come out with us 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. And um, this Friday is our first Friday fire. And I don't know how many of you know about first Friday fire, but it's a pretty awesome idea. It's an all day um, open house, if you will, to come in and worship the Lord and pray um, as you can. It's just kind of like from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., pastor will be here and he's just, uh, he's praying with you in and out. But like it allows you to come maybe before work, maybe after work to just stop in for a few minutes and just pray the awesome will of God on this church and in your life and in your neighbors and in, in the world. So if you have the chance, stop out this Friday, any anytime from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we're going to go ahead and go to the offering, um, which is my favorite part, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But I'm going to pray over the offering and send that out, and I'm going to tell you a couple things. So thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity to give, Lord Jesus, to be obedient to you and to go above and beyond to what you've called us in your name, God. Amen. So um, offering, it's amazing. And I know, like, it's not, um, it's not always so well known, but it's an amazing thing to obey the Lord, first of all, because I believe whenever you walk in obedience to the Lord, that he will bless you. He has said that he will bless you when you walk in obedience. So that's what we must do. And I, I even challenge you to ask the Lord for opportunity because who, um, who out there would love to give more? Who would love to just be able to bless and be a bit bigger blessing? I would, but you can't be a bigger blessing if you aren't already obeying the Lord with what he's given you. So that's what, you know, like I've been called to do and I love, I just love that I've always had, you know, tithing and great in my mind, but giving above and beyond as well. So um, the Lord has blessed me with an opportunity to give more by, you know, um, taking on my own business, which is great. It's been an amazing thing. And like, just ask for those opportunities. Like, Lord, what else can I be doing in my life that I can give back more so he can bless you more? So that's just one of the amazing things about giving into God because he always brings back. So why don't we uh, get excited because Miss Valerie is going to come and bring down the word. Thank you. Ryan. My beautiful, handsome, I'm sorry, trusted assistant Ryan here. Forgot to bring this out, but he knows how much I love him. We love embarrassing him too. You know, we love to talk about Ryan. He's so great. That was powerful worship. That last song went right along with what I'm going to share this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is already anointed, Lord. I thank you that you've anointed me, and I believe this morning that you've anointed every listener in this house. God, open up our ears and our eyes that the word of God can be revealed to us, and that we could receive it in the fullness that you intend. Thank you, Jesus. To God be the glory for all that you have done. Amen. Amen. Well, my mom and dad were big-time campers. I'd call them professional campers. We went every single summer to a park called Algonquin Park. Has anyone ever heard of it? Well, you're not Canadian. Oh, Melody has heard of it. It's actually quite a famous, amazing park way up in northern Ontario. My dad would take us there and my mom every single summer, and we made some incredible memories there. This handsome guy right here is my dad, and he was uh, very young at this time. He had probably kids around age two, four, six, and eight. And that's the stage at the, at the time that this story happened. And one day he decided to put us all in the boat. It was a beautiful, gorgeous, sunny day, and we were going to cross the other side of the lake. It wasn't very far. And go to the marina. Well, my mom and him got in the boat, all four kids, and uh, we headed out across. Well, we were barely a third of the way through, and honestly, a very freaky storm moved in. Have you ever been in, in that kind of storm when it just moved in within seconds? 
It had gone from a very sunny day to all of a sudden, the waves were seriously tossing this boat. I mean like major waves up and down. Water was just about to come in over the top of the boat. Dark cloud hovered over top of us. And of course, my dad looked at my mom, and my mom looked at my dad. And this six-year-old saw fear. And I saw fear grip my mom. And she reached down into the bottom of the boat and found a rope. And she picked it up, and she wrapped it and tied it tightly around her waist. And then she got the other end of the rope, and she tied it around the youngest child, which was my little brother, about two years old. And now today, if she told you that story, she'd say how ridiculous that is. That would mean sure death, <laughs> should the boat ever capsize. But fear does funny things to you sometimes, especially sudden fear. Fear can grip you and make decisions that are not always the best decisions. And I thank God today that my dad quickly turned that boat around and we made it back safely to shore and all six of us were just fine. But as a six-year-old, <clears throat> I saw fear. I saw fear grip my mom. And as a six-year-old, I saw how very, very quickly things can change. Life can change. A storm can move in really, really fast. Some of you can relate to that today because that's your story. You would look back over your life and say, never in a million years would I have thought that had happened to my family. Never in a million years did I think that I would have been facing this storm today. Never. It's not possible. How can it be? You can relate as to how quickly it moved in and how it took you off guard and how maybe you made some decisions that weren't so pleasing to God and didn't really line up with your faith and what you believe, but it came in quickly. And this morning I want to talk about another storm. The story is found in Mark chapter 4. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me. If not, you can follow along on the screen. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 says, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out, leaving the crowds behind although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped. And there was a great calm. And then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the winds and the waves obey him. So the story ends with Jesus asking them a couple questions and then them asking each other a couple questions. Who is this man? Did they know him at all? <laughs> Did they know who they were in the boat with? Well, let's take a look at just how well the disciples did know him. Let's take a little journey and walk where the disciples walked when they walked with Jesus. We're going to walk through Mark chapter 1 to Mark chapter 4. I love talking about Jesus. So I'm hoping that this part of my message just blesses you. Because we're just going to kind of jump into Mark and kind of pretend we're there on the dusty road walking with them. Let's find out just really what was going on in the life of Jesus and his disciples at this time. Jesus first showed up on the scene in Mark when he walked into John's baptismal service. Kind of interrupted it and Jesus then was baptized by John. And after he was, he immediately went out into the wilderness and he stayed there for 40 days. He had no food. The devil, of course, visited him because he always likes to vis visit us when we're weak and we're at our lowest point. He visited Jesus. He tried to tempt him three times to sin. But Jesus, of course, successfully resisted the enemy. He left the wilderness and he went out into Galilee and he began to preach the gospel. He began to preach the good news, the news of repentance and salvation, and the news that the Messiah had come. And as he was going through Galilee, he came across Simon. We know him as Peter, but at this time his name was Simon, and 
Simon and Andrew were fishing, and he called them and said, Come, I'm going to show you how to be fishers of men. And so they picked up, and they immediately went, and they followed Jesus. And a little farther up the shore, he sees James and John. And they were repairing their boat. And they too got up and followed John, or followed Jesus immediately. They left their father in the boat, and they took off with Jesus. Now the other Gospels talk more about how the other eight disciples joined them. But Mark right now focuses on these four. But we know that eventually they were all together. So these four, plus Jesus, went to Capernaum, and he began to teach in the synagogues. Well, people were absolutely amazed at his teaching. Now, remember, these are a very religious people. They are the people of Israel. And they had heard a lot of teaching, and they had no doubt spent a lot of time in the synagogue, but they had never heard a teacher quite like this man. The people were amazed. Jesus then, outside, cast out a devil. A devil, sorry. He cast out a devil from a man, and again, the people were amazed. They said things like, never in our life, never in our life have we seen a man with such authority. They were quite shocked, quite spellbound by him. So news of Jesus' popularity obviously began to spread like wildfire all over Galilee, and it got so that they could not contain the crowds. There were so many people. Eventually, they made their way to Simon Peter's home and healed his mother-in-law, and I don't know the full story on this. It might have been that Jesus called Peter aside and said, look, Peter, we got a problem because if you want to hang with me, and we're going to have to heal your mother-in-law because she's a problem. <laughs> I know nobody has a problem with a mother-in-law in this house. <laughs> we don't know that, but I know that Simon wanted his mother-in-law healed for whatever reason, so they made their way to, to uh, Simon Peter's house. She had a terrible high fever, probably threatening death, and he took her by the hand, he helped her to sit up, and Jesus said the fever left. And then she got up, and she was so much better that she was actually able to make them a meal. Must have been an amazing moment. So that same night, just after sunset, the whole town, now I don't think the Bible uses words carelessly, it said the whole town gathered, and Jesus healed many, many sick people. Various diseases, many that were demon-possessed. The Bible says the demons knew who he was. They would speak out loud and talk to him. Just before dawn, somewhere in the night, Jesus slips away, and he finds an alone place to pray. There's a whole message right there, how to slip away and be alone with Jesus. It's absolutely critical to your victory in your Christian walk with the Lord. So he slips away to be alone. And then the four disciples came and found him, and they said, Lord, ev everyone is looking for you. And Jesus said, I must go to other towns. I cannot just stay here alone. I've got to preach the good news. That's the entire reason I came. So then Jesus heals a man with leprosy. The man had begged him to heal him. He said, I know you can. He said, if you're willing, you can heal me. And this is the point where Jesus said, but I am willing, and he healed him. So the crowds grew so large, so much so that Jesus couldn't even get into a town. The town now had to come out and meet him on the hillside. So I would say that it's safe to say that the disciples were involved in a fair amount of crowd control. As a matter of fact, it must have felt kind of good. They were hanging with this very, very popular man, obviously full of authority and obviously full of power. So I'm sure they were doing their thing, just helping out Jesus and controlling the crowd and getting everybody in and getting them all out and making sure nobody's really bugging them like the little kids and stuff like that. And disciples had quite a job that day. But back in Capernaum, Jesus made his way to a house that was so packed with people that he was inside the house, but he couldn't move to get out of the house. He was trapped. He was in. So four friends of a desperate, paralyzed man got a great idea, and they cut open a hole in the roof, and they lowered down their paralyzed friends almost right on top of Jesus, the Bible says. Can you imagine? Are you feeling it with me? 
I want you to feel what these disciples were, where they were, what was happening. This was incredible. This man, Jesus, had shown up on the scene, on the scene, and he was, he was amazing. This was really awesome. They were watching Jesus very, very closely. This is where Jesus healed the man that was lowered down by saying, your sins are forgiven because he saw their faith. Aren't you glad Jesus can see our faith? Sometimes when we're not so good at expressing, he can see our faith. And he said, your sins are forgiven and the man was instantly healed. Well, this sent the religious people who were already not very happy with Jesus' popularity. This was like really, really taking away their uh, attention for sure. And so they got a little bit upset and mad at him because you can't forgive sins. That's like saying you're God or something. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus was God, amen? So the Pharisees started to really not like this guy. All this time, the disciples are witnessing this. So the paralyzed man stood up, picked up his mat, and walked out. This absolutely blew people's mind. This man was a cripple. He then sees Levi, the tax collector, and he calls Levi to follow him. The Pharisees, of course, didn't like that either. They said, why, is, why does he eat with such scum? Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And he said this, very important. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. That's the first step. They've got to know they are sinners. Today, nobody wants to hear the word sin, and they certainly want to, don't want to be told they're a sinner. But Jesus came to those who know, I know I'm a sinner. Jesus discusses fasting with his disciples, and he talks about its purpose. He begins to teach about the Sabbath. The Pharisees again challenge him on absolutely every teaching. He came along and he picked off a piece of wheat and he ate it. They had a fit about that. And then he healed a man with a deformed hand on the Sabbath day. So he worked because he, oh, I, I can't, I could just make fun of those Pharisees all day long, but I've probably been one now and then, so I better be careful. So he worked by picking the wheat. He healed a man on the Sabbath. So he was violating the Sabbath. But Jesus looked at the Pharisees, and this is important. He said, Jesus looked at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Jesus is still deeply saddened when we harden our hearts and can, can get very angry at a hard heart. So after the man was healed, the Pharisees left, and that's when they began to plot, we got to kill this guy. We got to find a way to get rid of him. So the plan was now in motion. Disciples were still working the crowds. The disciples were still witnessing it all. And the Pharisees went to work. Jesus' ministry began to, to expand vast numbers of people from far and wide. Finally, Jesus said to them, get me a boat so that, I don't, so that the people don't crush me. And then he stepped into the boat, kept it on the shore side there, and he began to teach from inside the boat. And those who were demon-possessed began to throw themselves on the ground in front of Jesus. And they, of course, identified. They said, you are the Son of God. Jesus tried to hush them. It wasn't time yet. But they knew. The demons knew exactly who he was. So somehow Jesus made it to a mountain, and he asked the 12 men to go with him. And here he told them, he said, men, go out and preach this good news that you've been listening to me preach, that you've been watching me. And he said, I give you, these 12 guys, I give you authority. I give you the same authority that I have to cast out the same kind of demons. But back down from the mountain, Jesus runs into his family, his brothers and sisters, they were a little embarrassed of Jesus, and they were telling the people, he's out of his mind. He's not quite right, our brother here. They're trying to get Jesus away. The teachers of religious law would say stuff like this. The Pharisees said, I'll tell you why he's got so much power. He's demon-possessed. That's why he's got so much power. The disciples are listening. 
Jesus responds by teaching this about blasphemy, the sin of blasphemy, the unforgivable sin. That's when we call what the Holy Spirit is doing of demons. It's something we never want to do. Then Jesus talks about his family for a while and explains this to the crowds. He says, my family are not really my brothers and sisters and my mom and my dad. My family are those who do the will of my father. That's why you and I are his family. Amen? He goes on to teach, and from this point on, he teaches a, a whole bunch of different parables, and I'm not going to take time to get into them, but I do encourage you to read the Gospels. Learn about Jesus, where he traveled, what, where he went, and what kind of a journey he was on. He taught about the farmer scattering seed, the lamp and the growing seed and the mustard seed. They were all about the kingdom of God. But it's evening time now. And this gets back to our story. Jesus says, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Well, that sounds like a great, great plan. They get to be alone with Jesus. They get to be away from the crowds for just a little while. Here's an interesting fact. In 1996, right along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, they found a boat buried in the mud. It was 26 and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide, and it could hold about 15 men. So I think that's pretty amazing. So it's safe to say that in that boat on that stormy night, probably all 12 disciples were there. There probably was about 13 at least in that boat. So they were alone with him at last. What a journey they'd been on. My goodness, they'd seen so much, so much power, so much authority. They had heard so much. They'd learned so much. And now they, here they were on the shore, ready to get into a boat. And in a matter of minutes, they're going to question if they even knew him at all. So let's get back to Mark chapter 4. And we're going to take this verse by verse and dig out a few things Till we get to the end. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind. This is in brackets in my Bible, but it's really significant to me that it's in there at all. The Bible says, although other boats followed, have you ever found that as a Christian that there's always somebody watching you? Somebody you've got to set the example for? Somebody you've got to watch your character and your responses and your faith? It matters. Because somebody's boat is following your boat as you move along with Jesus. And when your boat begins to rock and your boat begins to go through turmoil and threaten you. Somebody's following you. It matters what happens in that boat. And when you're experiencing the greatest calm and all is peaceful, there's still somebody following you, somebody watching you, somebody you're setting an example for. But soon a fierce storm came up. High winds were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. I don't know about you, but I've found out that the enemy loves to make himself seen after the greatest times we've spent with Jesus. After Jesus has displayed his power or we have felt and known his presence or he's answered prayer or we're growing and moving in God, the devil likes to stir things up a bit. He's going to stir them up. He's going to, this is what he's trying to say. He says, I'm going to move in quick and I'm going to move in and catch them off guard. That's what I'm going to do. Because right now they're kind of walking in the spirit and I'm going to make sure they walk in the flesh. I'm going to make sure they do something stupid. If I move in quickly enough, I can propel them as far away from walking in faith and believing me for the supernatural and I can make them as natural and as human and as fleshly as possible. He always tries that. A soon a fierce storm came up. Instantly, high waves were crashing. He wants you to forget that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit lives in you no matter what the storm is doing. 
So Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion, probably a bag of sand. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Well, here's Enemy Goals 101. Always make them doubt whether I care about them. (laughs) Always make them question if I ever could possibly love them. And even more so, threaten death. Bring fear or make them afraid of death. You see, the disciples had just been with Jesus for a mind-blowing tour of miracles. And now they were questioning, do you even care if we drown? Did they know him? This morning, I am so thankful that even in our most, most faithless statements, God still works on our behalf. Sometimes when we blow it, we say everything that we shouldn't say, things that have absolutely no faith, things that accuse God. Do you care about me at all? Like, were you even there, God? I've been traveling with you. I've been doing everything. Do you even care at all? But in our most faithless statements, Jesus still works on our behalf. Because the next verse says, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. And suddenly, remember that word, suddenly, the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. I don't know if you've ever had a great calm come into your life from Jesus, but if you haven't, you are yet to experience it. It will happen. And I don't know if you've ever had a suddenly happen in your life where God moved in quick. But I'm telling you, those are two things you can look forward to. Look forward to a great calm in your life. Look forward to a suddenly, because God wants to do both of those things in your life. I had an amazing experience with a great calm, and I know I've probably shared this before, but uh, I was pregnant with my fifth child and been told that uh, things weren't going well. They highly suspected from my blood and different things that something was wrong. And it, of course, caught me off guard. I wasn't ready for that storm at all. And uh, I went home, and I began to cry. And you might remember me telling this before. I cried. And I'm not going to imitate it, but only women can cry like this. (laughs) It was definitely the ugly crying. But uh, that kind of cry, I cried out with God. Basically, I kind of was saying, no, do you not care about me at all? Like, I can't do this, God. And I threw myself on the bed, and I was crying so hard that when I tried to stop, it was a, <laughs> like, you know, it takes 15 minutes to stop. It takes 15 minutes to just sort of calm down. <laughs> you can't just stop suddenly. You just can't. You can hardly get your breath. You've been crying that hard. And I'm telling you, it was an amazing moment. I'm not going to repeat the whole story in this message. But I rolled over on my back, and I had an experience with God that was so profound that instantly I was calm. I mean instantly. I went from going <laughs> to instant, absolute silence, absolute peace. I want you to know there is a great calm. A great calm. It can happen. It can change in a moment. I believe it with all of my heart. And there is a suddenly. So I want you to expect that if you're in a storm. I want you to ask him for a great calm in your life. A stopping, a silencing of the wind and of the waves. So now all is calm. And they asked, he asked his disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith after all they'd seen? Well, these are great questions. But this morning, I don't want to ask you in that way because I don't want you to even feel one moment of guilt or condemnation. But Jesus did say, do you, do you still have no faith? But I want you to consider the two questions he asked like this. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Whatever's going on. I want you to take it as an opportunity to remember that you do have faith. 
I want you to say to yourself, I do have faith. It's, it's a little battered right now. I do have faith. Oh, yes, I do. I want you to allow it to, to, to get that faith to rise up inside of you and say, I do have faith. I want you to allow it to remember that you walked with him and you talked with him in better times. That he was faithful to you. That he was good to you. I want you to answer that question by saying, no, he does love me. No, God didn't give me a spirit of fear. The enemy brought that fear into my life. God isn't shaking my boat. The enemy is trying to mess with my boat and with my love. So I want you to take it as an opportunity to say to yourself, I know this man. He's God. He's been God to me before, and he'll be God to me again. He has done so much for me. So answer those two questions. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? With saying, yes, I do. I know this man. I know him. I know him. It's going to happen. He's going to calm the storm. There's going to be a suddenly in my life. The last verse says that the, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind, even the waves obey him. Now for me, I don't know about you, but this is where the story takes a whole nother turn. They asked the question, who is this man? But the calm had already come. So obviously they were not terrified of the storm because the storm had passed. But afterwards, they asked the question, who is this man? You see, they looked at Jesus differently. They were absolutely terrified. What did they see? What did he reveal? They were terrified by what they saw. Who was he really? What was Jesus showing them in that moment after the storm? You see, they had followed him physically. They had witnessed great days with Jesus. They had witnessed amazing things. But my interpretation and what I believe is that now something very, very supernatural was going to happen. It was the beginning of divine revelation of who Jesus really was. It was a supernatural setup. You see, every believer, whether through a storm or some other way, every believer needs supernatural revelation of who Jesus is. It's okay to read the word, and you ought to read it all the time, but at some point that word has to become rhema. That word has to be life-giving, and that word has to be supernatural. It has to be divine revelation. See, God didn't cause the storm, but God will use anything to reveal himself to us. But this moment of sitting with Jesus was not enough to totally convince the disciples. Not yet. You see, we continue on through Mark and these 12 experienced even more amazing things. The feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000, demonic displays that were unbelievable, profound teaching. They saw Jesus betrayed, arrested. They saw him tortured. They saw him crucified. And by the end of Mark, you're not going to believe it, but they still didn't fully believe They'd walked with him through the entire time, and they still did not fully believe. They saw him, or, or Peter, actually, right near the end of Mark there, denied him fully. They said, I don't even know the man. Several of them told the women who ran from the tomb to tell them that Jesus was alive. Jesus is alive. And they said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. These were the disciples. They didn't believe. Even Jesus, after he died and was resurrected again, he came and showed himself to them and he talked to them numerous times. But they were still having trouble believing that he was alive, believing that he was God. And he rebuked them for it. All right, so knowing what we know today, 2018, we know that these 12 ordinary, uneducated, fear-filled fishermen Sinful tax collectors ended up being the writers and the subjects of almost the whole New Testament, except for Paul. So that's what it's all about. That's what our Bible is about, these 12 guys. 
So this means that at some point, that question got answered for them. Who is this man? They asked. So these men became completely different men. You know, the Bible describes them like this. It says that the 12 disciples completely turned the world upside down. These men went from not really believing who he was at the point of his death and resurrection to being completely and utterly, totally different men. So what happened? You see, they were incredibly bold. They defied their personalities. They got out of that box of fear that they'd been in. They just became completely different people. They were bold. They were courageous. They were unafraid. They were full of faith. And here's the real evidence. They ended up doing exactly what Jesus had authorized them to do at least twice, probably more. These guys, the 12 of them, took all that boldness and they began to cast out demons. And they began to heal the sick. And they began to preach the good news. These 12 endured torture, prison, and then actually felt it a joy to give up their life for Christ. Who are these guys? What had happened? So what answered that question with such finality? This. After Jesus ascended into heaven, they obeyed him. And they gathered themselves on the second floor of a house and they waited because he told them to do it. And they waited. And I hope you're familiar with the story of Acts 2 because I don't want to read the whole story today. But we know that when they gathered together, these men that were probably still heartbroken because Jesus had been crucified, these men that still didn't quite know even though he showed himself to them. Who is he? Who is he? And the Bible says that a mighty rushing wind blew into that place and baptized them and filled every one of them with the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. That's the answer to the question. These 12 men were then filled with the Holy Spirit and it sealed the question, Jesus is God. And it transformed their lives. And this morning, Jesus had told the disciples that I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And he will so fill you that you will do greater things than I ever did. And after they were transformed, Peter's very shadow would heal people. But you, my friend, know Jesus this morning. And you are full of the Holy Spirit. And you may need a fresh infilling of the Spirit. But I want to talk real quickly about two things that made the difference to these disciples. You see, in a storm, in a hard part in our lives, we just want things to get better. Stop the pain. Stop the shame. Oh, God, heal me. Fix my body. Heal my family. God, make the trouble go away. It's pretty much all we can focus on. And I promise you that God wants to work in your situation. Even though we didn't send the storm and we live in a sinful, fallen, hurtful world. But God wants to work in your situation. But I believe this morning that in the middle of the storm, or at the beginning, or at the end, that God has an even greater place to bring you to. Of course, we want things fixed. But the heart of God wants to bring you to a greater place. And that is a revelation of who he really is. To experience the glory of his resurrection. You see, the song said, forever he is glorified. Forever. There is an experience of, in God when we see the resurrected Christ. When the scales come off of our eyes, when it supersedes doubt and fear and unbelief, and when Jesus brings us 
to an understanding of who he really is. That's what we're after in the middle of a storm. That's what we ought to be focusing on. That's what we ought to be praying. God, show me the risen Christ, the glorified Christ, the one who is God Almighty from the beginning of time, the one who was and is and is to come, the one that holds eternity in his hands. Show me the resurrected, glorified Christ. That will make the difference in your life. That's the answer to the question. And the other thing is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I believe at the point of salvation that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. But I don't believe we always live like it and we always act like it. And I think every, uh, every day, every believer ought to say, fill me again, fill me again, fill me again. I believe, people, that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit... We are so longing for the boldness and the courage. We're longing to be a different woman. I want to be a different woman. I, you may want to be a different man. We want the, 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 this to happen in our lives. But it's about being full of the Holy Spirit, walking it out and living it in faith. Paul said this, that I may know him that I may know him. That's the exciting part of the verse. But he said this, in the power of his resurrection, I don't want to just know him when I can do crowd control, when things are going amazing, when I can see, wow, look at the miracles, look at the authority. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. It gets even harder than that. In the fellowship of his sufferings brings us to this, being made conformable to his image. Paul was saying, oh, I want to know him, but I want to be like him. I want to be like him. I want my life to affect other people the way Jesus' life affected people. I want to be like him. We don't pray that anymore. Make me like you, Jesus. Sometimes we just say, fix my mess, and I'll serve you and give you some money. No. I want to be like him. This morning I want to pray five things for you. If you're facing a storm this morning, then I want to have the privilege of praying with you. I want to come into agreement with you for a great calm, a stop, a silence, a stillness. I want to pray that there would be change in your circumstances and your situation. We're, we're going to pray about that in just a few minutes. I want to pray for a great and a sudden calm that he could bring healing to you, every part of your life. And I want to pray for all fear to be gone. I don't want you to walk in fear anymore. It's a terrible taskmaster. And I want to pray that you remember, like a rushing mighty wind, that you know him. Oh, yes, you do. You know him. You love him. And you trust him. And I want you to know with assurance, they did make it to the other side that night. All 12 of them arrived. You're going to make it to the other side. There are greater things like understanding the glorified Christ in his resurrection. There are greater things like the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, I want to pray for your faith to increase, that you would have a deeper revelation, that from the time you leave this church, there would be an unveiling, just a pulling back of the curtain of who Jesus is, that he would reveal himself to you right in the middle of your storm or right in the middle of any part of your life. Fourthly, I want to pray that you would desire a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, that there would be an assurance that I am filled, 
I know we tell you you are, but I want you to know you are. And I want you to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. You know he's called the great comforter, right? I want to pray that for you this morning. I want his resurrection power and the glory of his presence to be known by you because that is the ultimate peace. Fifthly, I want to pray that you would have the courage, the boldness, the strength, power, and authority to step into tomorrow. I want you to leave here feeling so full of the Holy Spirit that like the disciples, you have the courage, the boldness, the strength, the power, and the authority to walk in to that tomorrow, whatever it might hold. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing this for a minute because it's the truth. And if you want prayer this morning, I've got some people that would love to agree with you. They know him. They know him. Any of these five things, or even if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and that's what you want to do this morning, come on down and let me know that that's what you want. Let me pray with you. Let us help you. Let us agree with you. Step out and say, I need to be refilled. I need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. 